kidding or got it? I choose got it. <laughs> There's no way out. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> good. You've got to throw these catchphrases at me. That's good. <laughs> Well, look, I'm here with David Solomon, and uh, David, I'm really, um, really pleased to talk with you on the podcast. As I told you before, I've been looking for years to talk to someone who knew UG Krishnamurti, and um, people who are friends with UG don't tend to be out on the public stage flaunting their friendship with UG. So I've had to like dig and. Um, and I think maybe prove myself as a trustworthy person within the Friends of UG circle. But anyway, uh, finally, I was pointed to you as someone uh, who might be willing to talk to me about their time with UG. And so I'm just really happy that you're here and you agreed to do this. And I'm happy to talk about UG finally on the podcast. I'm really happy to talk about UG to anyone and, and um, our conversation before Brian was delightful. So I'm very happy to be here with you to do that. I just want to say up front that probably one of the reasons why people are uh, who knew UG and you knew what UG was about were, are reluctant to actually talk about this is because UG wanted most of all, I think, uh, to debunk the wisdom of ever relying on external authority, including and especially him. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, the last thing I want is for anybody to take what I have to say as a definitive word on anything other than my own take, you know, what I took away from UG, how I, what I feel about UG. He, he, he was a, um, he was an unbelievable I mean, it's it's hard to imagine someone like him actually was walking around. I mean, he was the most ordinary uh, guy. Um, I mean, people know him from his rants on the internet, and those were real. But I can tell you, he was, you know, he'd like to hang out and uh, Ross dress for less and Susie's deals. And in fact, to this day, when I go into a thrift shop, I'm there's something inside of me that's still hoping to hoping to see those white hairs just barely poking above, uh, <laughs> you know, the clothes on the shelf. Um, very often, you know, you just take us to Target. <laughs> that's amazing. Okay, yeah. well, before we like jump into UG stories, <clears throat> which I can't wait to get to, there's a lot of people out there who aren't even aware of UG and. Um, Often when I bring him up, UG Krishnamurti, they hear the Krishnamurti part, and I can see that they're going, they, there's a recognition, they go, ah, and I go, not the J Krishnamurti, and they go, oh, I go, UG Krishnamurti. Um, so maybe if you could start uh, by talking a little bit about who UG was, just gives a little bit of background on his life. Oh, boy. Um that's the kind of, I mean, I'm a weird guy. That's the kind of thing that we should have Maria on for that. She, uh, Your wife? Yeah, right. Um, I am terrible when it comes to, um, you know, paying attention to the details of anything. Um, <laughs> but his background was as a, uh, the same background as Jay Krishnamurti. He was um, sort of born into a, a theosophical Theosophically inclined family, and um, you know, as you know, J. Krishnamurti was supposed to be the world teacher, groomed for that by the Theosophists, led better, and so on, and so on. And on the day when he was supposed to take the stage and announce that he was the world teacher that had long, everyone has long been waiting for, he got walked up on stage and said, you know, basically, no teacher, no teaching, no taught, and walked off, more or less. That's my understanding. And again, one should never, no one will ever mistake me for a historian. Um, so <laughs> I, I apologize for that. But so they both had that yeah. philosophical background. And um, UG was somebody in the um, Theosophical Society structure. Uh, he made his living for a while as a speaker, talking about uh, 
the world religions and their contributions to mankind. Um, and Yuji, although he wasn't related to Jay Krishnamurti, their, their families knew each other. Uh, Yuji was um, going to his talks a lot. Um, and uh, although Yuji ranted against J. Krishnamurti quite a bit for seemingly, uh, at least seemingly abandoning his no teacher, no teaching, no taught by forming schools and uh, protecting the teaching in its pristine purity. Uh, in the end, I think Yuji always kept him close. Hmm. And a lot of my friends will disagree with me about that, but that's okay. That's how I uh, experienced him. I think as my good friend, uh, Douglas Rose Stone told, um, may have told you, Yuji, I think Douglas was the one who asked the question, who is the most remarkable man you ever met? And without hesitation, the guy that Yuji always railed against as having a, a girl at every port and, you know, put him down in every way he possibly could. He said without hesitation, Jay Krishnamurti was the most remarkable man he had ever met. Hmm. Now, all of that said, I think most people would agree that um, Yuji was by far the more radical uh, of the two Krishnamurtis. Jay Krishnamurti had a very great world following. Yuji did his best to keep the numbers around him very small and said the books, his books were meant to keep people away, not to bring them close. <laughs> yeah, my read on it, um, kind of having exposure to, to Jay Krishnamurti and Yuji, like kind of secondhand, uh, and then reading through the accounts of uh, friends of UG who put out these books, I see them almost as kind of like brothers and like rivals in a, in a way. And so I think there's like, there's love there. There's obviously like a really strong kind of karmic connection between the two, but that friction I see more as kind of like uh, a brotherly kind of thing. Does that feel about right to you? I do. Um Douglas put it this way. He said, you know, there was thesis and, and antithesis. They, get, mm -hmm. they, went, they went together. And uh, he said, he actually translated their names. I think he said that uh, Jiddu means Greece. And um, Yuji, one of Yuji's names, I don't remember which, uh, means salt. And the Upaluri. salt. Upaluri. Upaluri, and so he said that essentially the salt neutralized the grease. And if you take them at their word. Oh, they, Greek, grease like cooking grease, not like, I was thinking the Greek mind kind of. No, grease. His, <laughs> his salt neutralized uh, JK's grease. With the, uh. net result, with the net result, they cancel each other out. And essentially, mankind is left with no footprint from either, which was actually the you know, the whole point of no teacher, no teaching, no taught, because then, you know, people seize on anything and make an orthodoxy out of it, and they end up hurting people instead of um, helping them release their burden. Right. And of course, I think UG was um, right about that. Like what happened with uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti's teachings, uh, people formed an organization around him, and it's been like codified and upheld and continued like there's still a J. Krishnamurti foundation in Ojai that uh, I've actually taught yoga at right. <laughs> so he was a presence there but when we brought yoga there my yoga teacher had also been um, somewhat friends with UG and so he brought a lot of UG to J. Krishnamurti's retreat center in Ojai and so there was that kind of interesting mix there and maybe a little friction between the the JK devotees and the kind of like, I don't know, the liberation path, like the obliteration path of UG. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. UG was like a, somebody said, like a grenade in the brain. One of the people who was, uh, who introduced him, that's how we introduced him. Uh, mm. a charming, alarming, disarming man. And another one said, every time UG, talks it's a grenade in the brain and that's uh and there, you yeah. know if you see him ranting 
and really, uh, and you know, screaming at people, yelling at people, and and that certainly happened. But I, I mean, I have to say, it really depended upon how fixed you are with anything that you were thinking. So when the people who were J. Krishnamurti fans came, he, he was especially harsh with uh, J.K. Mm. And I'm sure from Yuji's point of view, he was helping J. Krishnamurti with his people and not, not hurting them. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I love that image of the grenade in the brain. Like if, if there's a kind of concrete structure in the mind, a grenade is going to have a devastating effect. But a grenade in the ocean, eh, it's going to create a few ripples, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that maybe I'll point out, because uh, Western people get really confused about this, Krishnamurti, uh, often in Indian names, the second name is the given name. So Krishnamurti is a, a given name, and it's fairly common in India. So the UG and the Jiddu part are the family names. So the Upaluri, Gopala was Yuji's uh, family names, and uh, Jiddu was uh, the other Krishnamurti's family name. Um, so that's why I think it's confusing for people. They think Krishnamurti is the surname, and so they must be from the same family. But there are these like interesting connections, like Yuji's grandfather was a prominent theosophist, and he knew Blavatsky, and I don't know, he was a lawyer and had a lot of money, and he saw something in Yuji, and I think he got caught up in the idea that um, his grandson might be one of the chosen ones, that he was an enlightened avatar or something. And so both like Jiddu and Yuji were groomed from a young age to be these uh, these avatars. And it's so strange how they ended up both in their own way rejecting this idea and um, kind of uh, trying to push people toward the, you know, like what JK called the um, the pathless path, that kind of thing, and that there is no teacher other than your kind of inner authority. So this, they have so much in common, but their, I don't know, their methodology was so different. Definitely. Well, they were they both, as I see them, and I'm I'm no expert on uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti either. Um, but I believe they, that's what they, when, when they're talking about no teacher, no teaching, no taught, I think the main thing that they really wanted for their people was that they turn towards their own authority and, and reject ev everything else. Mm -hmm. be, your, so, be, be yourself, not what other people want you to be or think you should be. Right. Well, that's one of the things that I love about UG's message. Um, it's very similar to Carl Jung in that way. He thought that the, um, the, if you were going to find some kind of purpose or meaning in life, it's about becoming who you really are and uh, doing away with all the cultural conditioning and expectations, um, that kind of burden of uh, conformity in a way. And that um, that's kind of like the best thing you could offer the world is a, a, a kind of unique expression of what it is to be a human. Just like every flower is different. Every tree is different. Every bird is different. And why would it be different for us? I can't imagine it would be. <laughs> Me neither. That's why we get along. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it's, it seems, you know, self-evident if you actually think about it. You know, why, or, why should we all yeah. be the same? It's an incredibly boring and false world that we end up with. And, and, and we end up with all of these existential threats as a direct result of that. Because we're not really paying attention. We're just going through the motions and playing by somebody else's playbook and never really tapping into our real genius and what we actually have that we were given to contribute to this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how our um, and like I like how UG also didn't discount how our upbringing and like our family history contribute to the forming of our unique self. Like there wasn't some idea that we're some pure spark of divinity, because <clears throat> um, that in a way is an idea that we're all the same underneath it all. But I think uh, he really. Um, accepted that we are formed by 
how we're brought up and what our culture is that we grew up in and all of that. And that that's a part of it. And to not throw that out either. Yeah, I, I, I don't see Yuji as ever suggesting that we should throw anything out. Uh, he was about accepting the world and ourselves exactly as we are. And in doing that, um, life takes over and blossoms in its own natural way. One's own life and what grows around that. It, you know, I was hinting earlier that um, Yuji really was not only um, staunchly promoting everyone being themselves, but recognizing that all of life around us has a right to be what it is too. And to accept the wisdom of our bodies and accept the wisdom of uh, the natural world. And boy, if you were, uh, he, let me give an example of what I'm trying to say. When Yuji was in Palm Springs in the last years of his coming to the US, he lived in a cottage where there were an abundance of black widow spiders. Hmm. Now, you know, people concerned about Yuji with, you know, wanting to kill the spiders. Yuji used plastic cups and napkins to transport them out of his cottage because they have a right. They have every right, as much of a right as we do. And they're more intelligent, you know, than, than we are. They live in, in accord with the harmony that is inbuilt in nature. I mean, after all, all of life co-emerged and, and achieved uh, a, a relatively stable balance, which we benefited from for so long. And then we get it in our heads that we know better than nature, either in what we're trying to make the body do against its natural way it is, um, but we also try to engineer, we think we are the masters of nature and we adopt a really aggressive attitude towards it. And he, he used to say amazing things in remarkably short bites. So his comment on this, which to me make him an environmentalist of sort, or he'd say, you know, if you, all these people, they're trying to kill the snakes you know, to protect the, the crops. But if you kill all the snakes, the field mice will have a field day. That's, mm -hmm. That was uh, a comment that I think is very powerful. And I don't think it could be shorter than that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, he is uh, very much an ecologist, you know, um, uh, really honoring the intelligence of nature and you know, in our own expression, the body as nature. And um, yeah, uh, one of his like little blasts just comes through that thought is the enemy. And so somewhere along the way, human beings became separated from nature due to uh, thought and the formation of an individual egoic self. And I think he thought that was like at the core of our downfall Right? Would you say that's accurate? Oh, that's a big, that's a good, that's a, you know, to think of what's core when you talk about Yuji is difficult. Uh, for sure. me, for me, it is. Um, I think it, it's certainly what you described is a part of it. Would you mind if I think on that for a bit? No, that was a good um, <laughs> I, I would, thought is the enemy. What's the response? Just respond. <laughs> the response to that, I, I would. I don't know if he, if he, you know, he said so many little things. You have to put them together. You can focus on like one little statement that he's made, and it essentially um, is not correct because he only spoke in these simple um, statements as the need was there to respond to what was happening in the room. To get the complete picture, you got to hang in there for a while. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, so, um, so I, I, I we, we don't want to, we don't want to pin would, UG down. Yeah, by saying, I, but I, you know, I would say, and I'm emphasizing, you know, it's just coming from me and I'm no, I'm no, no expert for anybody else, that I think he would say, 
our problem is that you know to navigate in this world you need to have the what people are calling you know ego structure let's say ego structure otherwise he can't find his way ug was a big fan of credit swiss i'm sure it would pain him to see what was happening to credit swiss today but um i can't get from point a to point b unless that thing unless ug is there the only difference between me and you all is that uh, Yuji is there only when he's needed. Otherwise, otherwise he goes into the background and he's just being, you know. Mm -hmm. But you guys, you keep yourself going all the time. So there is a, a constant disconnect from uh, nature. And that separation has harmed each of us. You know, we suffer from being false, from not being connected to the life excuse me, that sustains us all. And because we're separated from it, we don't respond uh, to it properly. We don't protect it. We, you mm -hmm. know, we think we're better than it. We're separate from it. And now we have, um, you know, the sixth mass extinction event the planet has ever seen. The first one caused entirely by man. Primates now on the list of endangered species. Yeah. Yeah, he talked about how uh, like UG, the personality, the persona would come forward when it was needed. Like you said, if he needed to get directions to the, the Swiss credit <laughs> ATM or the thrift shop or whatever. And then it would um, kind of recede into the background into what he called a, um, I think he called it a declutched state of mind. Like there was a kind of a, a free, uh, a releasing of the the egoic structure into a more kind of free flowing state. Yes. Uh, and I I like that image of the declutching. Like when you put down the clutch, it's just everything's just spinning uh, freely and nothing's getting in the way. And then when somebody posed them a question. Oh, UG would have to come forward and he'd have to engage and put something into words. Um, but he would talk about just uh, often lying around and relaxing in a declutched state. Yes. <laughs> until, until he was called on. <laughs> exactly. And his, um, he had a, um, a take on <clears throat> Maya, which he said means to measure. This is related to your point, um, to, just in case it wasn't clear. Uh, and he said, measure from a fixed point. And when we have this fixed, this kind of a fixed persona that never goes away, everything revolves around that and is measured by that. Yeah, it's a, it's a reference point for everything else in your experience. And when he had his, um, I don't know what you want to call it, his calamity, that's what he called it, the calamity. The calamity. Um, that fixed point was no longer so fixed. The, that, I think, was what um, he meant by the declutched space. So it, it, you, you not only could, you know, breathe in and um, uh, function as, a, as an ego in the world, but also to let go of it as well, to be empty of it. And with UG, um, you know, less you, more life with a capital L. Ooh, that's a nice t-shirt. Less you, more life. Yeah. Is that something he said or is that something that just came up in your mind? That's, that's my summary of uh, my take. Oh, I like it. You know, and the other thing that for people who aren't familiar with UG, that's very important to understand about this is, is you know, you, as you know yourself, that you can't make any of this happen. I mean, you is the problem. It's not the, the solution. And mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do or not do to make it happen. The, this movement from uh, being a, a fixed and stagnant pool uh, to uh, being, more, you know, more free flowing in tune with, with nature, that that he said that's a causal and there isn't anything uh, that you can do to make that happen. 
Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love, um, so he, I mean, he was a seeker from the get-go. Uh, he was a scholar of all different religions, of philosophy. Of, he took psychology in university. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the theosophists put him up as a, a touring lecturer is because he he knew Indian philosophy so well and could communicate it to a Western audience or an Indian audience. Um, uh, where was I going to go with that? Um, my mind just became declutched. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Let's stay there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back. It'll it'll reclutch at some point. It'll get back into gear. Unfortunately, <laughs> right? This, this is the problem. This is what UG does to you. I mean, if uh, if he's like kind of in your field, uh, he can have this effect on you. And it uh, to me, it like I've had some really interesting kind of declutching experiences since um, I was I was kind of uh, turned on to UG in a way, and uh, that. That's the effect, really, is uh, something letting go in the mind. And what then arises for me is always laughter and like giggling and like a bubbly effervescence. And I just felt it. But OK, so I reclutched. Here's what I was going to say <laughs> is um, one of the things I love about him is how he was a seeker and he did all of the sadhana. He said he went through and um you know, achieved all of the different samadhis and everything. And then I love how he says this. And in spite of all that sadhana, this calamity happened. Like it wasn't of his doing because people try to say, well, it was all those years that you did the yoga practice and meditation that led to this. And you said, no, it's in spite of that, it happened. That's right. <laughs> Just... And that, that, you know, he insisted that there are some things where you could say, well, he said this, but this sounds like a little bit different. He said on another occasion, but he never changed that note. That note was, in my experience, was always the same. It, it happened despite it, not because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was a big part of what he tried to get across to people was that um, the seeking for something like enlightenment, whatever we call it, the seeking is what actually takes you away from your natural state, which is already reality, already present, already here and now. And that's a really tough one um, for people to grasp because you can't actually grasp it. You have to let go of the seeking in a way, but even that becomes some kind of program for the ego okay, now I've got to get rid of the seeking. Right. So you're still always like chasing something. I always, the image that came to me early on when engaging with UG was um, the quest for enlightenment or integration or whatever we call it is like a carrot on the end of an, a very long stick that just keeps getting longer and longer every time we start to go after it. Um, and, and so that's a tough one. So he said that it's a causal, you can't make it happen. Trying to make it happen gets you further away from it. Any so, movement, he said any movement in any direction takes you far further away from it. And here's another statement that I think should be considered along with that one in the same, you know, sentence or paragraph. He also said, now I'm having one of those moments, uh, where I was going to say, uh, uh, shoot. I'm sure it will circle back in the middle of the next very important thing you say, and then I'll have to interrupt you. But uh, uh, we're just taking turns driving here, you know. Um, yeah, so the seeking is the problem. You're gonna, another statement uh, came to mind. Yeah. But uh, it'll it'll come back to me. But he, here's here's something um, else about maybe it goes some something that I have to say now goes on the backside of that T-shirt about you know less me more life. Uh, when you were with him and um, he was gone while he was with you. I mean, unless someone asked him a question, so you'd sit there. You, there were. And sometimes he'd go, oh, we're just sitting here and eyeballing, come on, say something, you know, but, but it, it happened that there were times when nothing, 
nothing was going on in, in either in the people or in, in him. And when things weren't going on in him, all of that energy was there. I mean, people have been around teachers. Actually, everyone's had experiences, I think, more likely uh, with people who were in depressed states. And it, it God, I got, I got to figure out how to stop this. Uh, these, whoever's trying to text me is really going to town. <laughs> <laughs> edit that out right leave it in it's hilarious but um i know i lost it again ah, damn it so when you're around him uh well oh, you're, I, you're I, gonna I, say make the analogy to being around people who are depressed yeah people they a person's energetic state can can and does have an effect on everyone around them so when he's sitting around and yuji disappears and, it's, and things are really coming through him, the energy around him could be more than stunning. I mean, he could put an entire room out. I mean, everyone just tongue, you know, tongue out, drool, drool bucket city is how I refer to it, in no time <laughs> flat. And he, and he would put out into the room, I mean, I think sometimes intentionally, um, different vibes. There was a certain vibe that he would put out into the room. I, I have no idea why he was doing what he was doing. Most of what he did was pretty invisible to us all. But it was like fingernails on a blackboard. Everybody would be so uncomfortable. And other times he would just put you out. And I just I'm just telling the story so people get an I, you know, more of an idea about what it was like to hang out with him. Uh, because we had just a small number of people, like when we were together in Europe, you'd have like two or three cars of people visiting him at a time, and that would be an entourage, and Yuji would take us nowhere. We'd just drive around. He would drive us around to the Tri-City area in his latter years of um, misery, an actual town in, in Switzerland, um, Meladier, which means madness, and Les Enfers, which means uh, hell town. And he would take us there for, you know, for, uh, ostensibly to get coffee, but often he wouldn't even let, let us get out of the car. He'd just take us to misery, madness, and hell town, and then back. I mean, talk about going nowhere. And um, yeah, no movement. Maybe I'm circling back. I don't know. Uh, no movement in any, movement in any direction takes you away from yourself. And the other thing, God, it is very, it, whenever I think about him, I go, you know, I go like this. Ah, now I'm ready to kill, 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 kill. You got those notifications coming up? You wanna pause this for a second? I'll see if I can find the, the uh, setting for notifications and turn that off. It's, yeah, sure. Again, I don't, don't recall what, what I was gonna say, but we could just, yeah, well, I would love to hear the story about how you came to meet Yuji. Like, tell us a little bit about your life before that time. Like, were you a were you a seeker? Were you looking for gurus and and that whole thing? Yeah, um, I had um, two teachers before Yuji. One was Osho. Ah. My favorite. Yeah, I know. You, you do a remarkable uh, imitation. You must do that. And the other was um, a very, not a very well-known teacher at all in, in the tradition of uh, Gurdjieff. And, he, you know, who, he was also a guy who ran against Jimmy Carter for uh, the governorship of uh, Georgia and later mm -hmm. became a speechwriter for him and was a dean of a law school, you know, that's my background is law. And so that was kind of a hoot to hang out with this guy who wore uh, snakeskin boots, wore his shirts open so you could see his chest, uh, was a dog in, in every sense of the word, you know, he'd go after the, the women of his you know, friends and so on and so forth. But um, in any case, uh, yeah, so, Seeking and, you know, my seeking was precipitated by um, a really horrible first experience of my inner world. Now, getting back to your question, 
um, my brother-in-law had a tremendous influence on my wife. He was also uh, an Osho person and came into the orbit of UG first, influenced Maria and Maria said, hey, my wife, for anyone who doesn't know me, hey, uh, you know, he talked about his first, he talked about his exp experience, his big experience as being calamity. And I said, let me see that. You know, so I read what he had to say. And, said, and he's talking, if you knew what it was, you wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot barge pole. So already, you know, I'm used to people seducing, teachers seducing you with um, promises of bliss and light and, uh, and so on and so forth. And he's, he's saying, if you knew what it was, you wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot barge pole. And that was what was attracted me to Yuji because, mm. frankly, um, that statement and his experience really resonated with me. And it's easy to accept things when, uh, take things in stride when you're experiencing harmony inside or some, you know, something beautiful or sexual attraction or whatever the thousand and one addictions one might have in this world. Uh, and it's not so easy to take things in stride when what's coming to you, gift from the universe or life, is difficult. And that this part of Yuji's, I mean, it's it was mainstream Yuji. It wasn't like a, an occasional statement because the other teachers talk every once in a while. They tell, yeah, there are difficult things. But Yuji's like from the beginning, this is the end of a man. This is the end of you. If you think you're going to get anything from me, you couldn't be more wrong. If anything, you might lose what you think you have. So that was the big attraction. And uh, Yuji absolutely did not uh, disappoint when it came to helping us go to misery, madness, and hell town. That was, <laughs> it seemed to be, um, that was his contribution. You know, with other teachers, it was always possible, not only possible, but likely that you would end up on a trip that was essentially spiritual bypass. But there was no bypass with Yuji from the get go. Mm -hmm. That was always about um, facing the, whatever is for you, your harsh reality. And um, I needed help. I wanted help with that. Hmm. And, you know, you, you, there, no way out means you have to, you have to face the music. Mm -hmm. if, you, if your path is taking you away from the music, it's not, it's not worth anything. Yeah. And, and in order to, and each person, I think it's very different. What can make you comfortable enough to face things that maybe your whole life you've avoided facing? It's, that is not a, an easy turn to make unless you find you have no choice. And, and there comes a time, I think, in everyone's journey when there's no turning back. You know, the other shore has disappeared and you're in the middle of nowhere. And Yuji's guidance was don't try to go anywhere, stay right. What, what's, ha what's coming, take, take it in stride. Mm. Would you mind saying a little bit more about uh, this early awakening experience you had and um, kind of things that you went through? It's just because I'm thinking about the listener and um, I know a lot of people are uh, maybe doing some kind of spiritual practice or even doing um, like psychedelics, you know, seeking some kind of enlightenment or freedom from suffering. And I know from my work as a, a you know, personal experience and work with hundreds of people as a counselor um, that uh, what often comes up is a kind of calamity or a, a dark night experience or a terrorizing existential experience. Um, just for relatability's sake, would you mind just sharing a little bit about that? You don't have to, but uh, it might be helpful. Well, I don't mind. Um, 
Well, I drowned when I was three and a half. So I got off to a bad start. Mm. If it weren't, weren't for an aunt who knew uh, CPR, I, I would not have, uh, I'd not be here. And that experience um, really <laughs> had a profound impact on the rest of my life and still does. I had the recurring dream throughout my childhood of, of, of dying uh, over and over and over again. Hmm. When other kids were running the 100 yard dash uh, on our black tar, whatever that surface is, uh, playground in elementary school, my, when I started exerting myself, if I exerted myself to any degree, my heart would start pounding out of my chest. So that kind of um, experience, if you talk to people that have sort of spontaneous uh, energy ri arisings, that's what they share in common, near-death experiences. And um, the theory behind it, which I find to be true, is there's um, energy coiled around the base of the spine. And when the body is getting ready to die, it uncoils. It, like you know, a snake, it uncoils, the energy rises, ready to exit with you, stage left. So that happened for me, and my energy was unhinged at that really, really early age. And I suffered from migraine headaches my, um, for a good part of my life. And at the age of 21, I, at, I was then, um, poised to go to law school. I was just finishing my undergraduate education. And I had a number of um, external calamities. I, uh, I, I stumbled into uh, a gang fight at a pizza place in the most unlikely uh, setting in uh, East Long Meadow, Massachusetts, near the border of uh, the Massachusetts, Connecticut border dueling gangs from Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, and I was high on, high on hashish with a bunch of friends at a pizza place. And they started a brawl with us in the middle of the pizza place. And it ended up spilling into the um, parking lot. We were really uh, outnumbered. They had chains and knives. And I instinctively went for the, the leader of the gang and actually got him on the ground and I was windmilling his face with my fists and had no doubt, I'm not a pacifist. I thought I'd mention that in any sense. Because I, I discovered in, in, that, in, in a circumstance like that, you, you discover what you're capable of doing when your life is threatened. And I know I would have killed him. But for the fact that three of his friends came and you know removed me from him and held me up against a wall and beat me unconscious, hmm. beat, beat me, kicked me, uh, nearly killed me. And that, um, and a number of other things that happened to me in this very short time frame, set me up to revisit that space that I had when I drowned. Everything came up and it was, horrible because it was not just um, it, the experience of this energy and what it did in terms of my perceptions was, was traumatic, was the most traumatic thing. But in addition to that, there's all of the unresolved trauma comes up. When that energy is flowing like that, everything comes up. Mm -hmm. So my first, that's the, before that moment, I was just a beer drinking, gal loving guy looking for fun. I loved the venture on the road. I used to hitchhike everywhere. The, the farther away, the better. Sometimes it didn't matter. I just, where I was going, I just go wherever the traffic took me. And so I had kind of an adventurous spirit, but nothing that I had ever experienced in my life prepared me for that. Mama never told me about that. And when the energy rises, I know in, in, um, in um, the way Buddhists look at this, when the energy rises, 
to the um, up to this point. Third eye. Mm -hmm. Third eye. There's something they call a banga. It's a kind of a milestone in their way of looking at things. And loss of body consciousness is one of the things that um, happens when the energy gets to there. And when this, when my energy just went crazy, you know, like this freight train type of experience is rushing through. Uh, by the way, this is not, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm kind of in, uh, in agreement with Yuji that there is no such thing as enlightenment as a, a permanent state. And I don't claim, so I'm not making any claim, any claim of being special. I just got hit by a bus, that's all. And, uh, and I don't, I, you know, it's not as a result of any merit on my side, other than the fact that I ne nearly drowned myself. I'm trying to uh, follow my cousin into um, Long Island Sound before I was ready to do that. But anyway, so I have all this stuff coming up and suddenly I had experienced myself as a fixed point and very contained. I never had a sense that I was that I extended beyond this body. And suddenly there's empty space and I can't think, I could no longer think. And I being, uh, uh, I had been building a, working on my mind, thinking that was the best you can do in this life. Uh, and suddenly this place that was my refuge was gone. All safety was gone, boundaries are gone can't think, can't form any, can't form a word. It's really frightening. So mm. it was out of that experience that one day I came to read about someone who had been to Pune with Osho. And um, this, he recorded all of these talks with his people in what he called Darshan Diaries. And there was one Darshan Diary, it was called Hammer on the Rock. And in Hammer on the Rock, um, one of his people came up to him in Darshan and said, try to describe this very frightening experience, which was remarkably like mine. And I, I read this to see, and I was waiting, what was he going to say about this? And his response was, it was good. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. For me, I didn't need to know anything more about him. I didn't go there, um, contrary to what many people suppose about folks who go to Rajneesh for sex, for, for you know, for uh, communal living. I mean, I, I knew nothing about the world of meditation that you would intentionally do. Um, I was, yes, I said, you know, intoxicants and and adventure and girls. That that that. To me was what life was about before but he, he seemed to know something more about navigating that inner space than i did and i needed some tips about mm -hmm. how to be comfortable in my own skin again and that mm. that is why i started um, wasn't seeking for enlightenment i was seeking just to feel okay again in fact you know my early my first efforts were essentially to put the snake back in the old skin. That doesn't work. And yeah. that's it. Yeah, wow. I can relate uh, to a lot of what you're talking about. Um, I never really thought about the early traumas and near-death experiences that I had as being some kind of catalyst for what came later. Um, so I'm going to sit with that. But... Uh, one of the things that happened to me after kind of a second traumatic event that I think brought up a lot from earlier, like yourself, um, was I started, I, the way I might put it is I started to try to drown the snake with alcohol and, and drugs. And um, that worked for a while, you know, until it didn't work anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so I started to uh, seek help in... Um, kind of sorting myself out, you know, in my uh, early mid thirties, I call it my midlife wake up call. And then that led me down a whole nother path, which is how I ended up encountering UG. Um, 
something about UG when I encountered his teaching just it just felt so right and true. Uh and I'm not sure, you know, obviously it doesn't resonate with everyone, but for me it was like, oh yeah, this is it. Yeah. And it was like a kind of um a permission to stop trying to seek any particular answers or a way out. You know, like one of his things he would say is no, there's no way out. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I really appreciate that. And I, I appreciate like what seems to me like UG's um, kind of fearless honesty and authenticity. <clears throat> and people I've met along the way who have been with, you know, these guru types and, you know, quote unquote, enlightened people, they talk about what it was like to be with them. What I imagine it was like to be with UG was permission to just be yourself yes with all of your idiosyncrasies not in a some kind of um facade of purity and bliss but with all of your um kind of warts and all all of your idiosyncrasies and uh defects and everything and that to me is just like it seems like it'd be the greatest gift it was to to be around someone who lived like that and felt that in itself you, when you were with him you felt unburdened because you could just be yourself you didn't have to put on uh, any false faces in fact you didn't even be called because he picked up on that and immediately you know clobbered you one way or another <laughs> and you you had no choice there's some things that are in your hands it wasn't if you hung out with him being as real as you could be was the only option Mm, as real as you could be so uh your brother-in-law introduces you hey check out this guy and what did you read like mystique of enlightenment or something one of the early books the book that maria brought to me and and i yeah that was like uh i think from talks in the mid 70s right so what time period are we talking about where you you know you got handed the book um, I think it was 1996. Okay. And you're in California or where are you living at that point? At that point, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Uh, I'm working so, for Intel up, up there, yeah. Yeah, but not far from where Osho ended up having his, his commune, right? Well, uh, that was in the eastern uh, part of Oregon. This is, you know... Uh, you, you know, kind of um, the backwater of uh, Oregon and and not, um, you know, Port- Portland is very progressive. Needless to say, the eastern part of uh, Oregon is not. Right. Yeah. And that was much kind of documented in that um, really terrible docu- quote unquote documentary about Osho on Netflix, the wild, wild country. Uh, it was a lot about that um, kind of conflict between him and the conservative uh, county that he was in um but i'm just trying to kind of get a sense of time and place so uh, you're in uh, oregon ug was periodically coming to the u.s right mm-hmm. when did you h- how did it happen that you actually got to meet him well um i was really gung-ho after i read what ug had to say um you know it's like yeah you know i read that and was like yeah this is this is the guy I would like to, to be with, and Maria uh, called him. You called him. He'd answer, <laughs> he'd answer his phone. You know? Wait, how, okay. So this is maybe early days of the internet. But how did you get Yuji's phone number? Well, um, Maria's brother, I, my beloved friend um, and brother-in-law, um, knew the phone number of. Uh, his host in Bangalore, Mr. Chandrasekhar. And uh, so it was easy to, to call and, and get Yuji's number. At any given time, Yuji had his own BBC. You know, you could find out where Yuji was by calling certain people. And huh. we, we got that number and Maria called him and he was down in Southern California and, um, Yuji said, you know, 
I may be coming up to Seattle, maybe rather than coming down uh, to Palm Springs, it would be a shorter flight for you guys to go from you know Portland to uh, Seattle. And Maria sagely said, you say might, I'm not taking any chances. She said, okay, come on down. So we flew on down. He was staying at the Ocotillo Lodge. We got some hotel somewhere and uh, just went to see him. So was, very, very informal, right? He's, he's in a room in the Ocotillo Lodge. A few people are lounging around on chairs, joking around. As he said, if you come in, you had never seen or talk with him before, he'd say, we, we don't talk about anything serious here. We just gossip, mm. you know? And so we're hang, hanging around and um, it was wonderful. Okay. So you show up at the Ocotillo <laughs> Lodge. <laughs> I just love the name too. I mean, it's so kind of Palm Springs and American. And uh, really? so they say, go to room uh 14 or whatever and so you go in and he's there with some people lounging around did you go in with any expectation of something different like what what uh what was it like walking into that well the contrast between you know this potentate image of osho you know on a throne with the robes with the spacesuit on <laughs> <laughs> you know, where, you know, every pause was pregnant, as you said, drawn out with that, you know, to to this, this guy lounging around in his pajamas, you know, and joking around with his friends. They, what they were working on when I walked in is something they worked on, Yuji worked on with whoever was with him to the very end. He was, he liked to have things in threes in terms of his, his statements. So we're going to do this. And then it was uh, God willing, funds availing. No, it was weather permitting, God willing. And then he wanted a third. It had to be, you know, it had to be three things. And it's like, this is a silly exercise they're doing, right? And, and it was just fun. It's like uh, sitting around brainstorming um, kind of spiritual maxims, but well, yeah, you know, he had his own money maxims. That that mm -hmm. was it was wonderful to be around in the birthing of that and all the fun he had with that. Uh, yeah. But but yeah, it was playful. I mean, um, one time when we were hanging out with him in um, in Stad, I mean, we just were playing cards all the time, poker. In fact, there are pictures of Yuji delighted, people laughing. I mean, he'd have people sing and dance and do all kinds of, of nonsense, just, just fun. Mm -hmm. Here, everyone was, it felt really so intimate. Um, and people get a very wrong impression from just watching uh, the YouTubes. I got to tell you. Yeah. So that first meeting, like how many, how many days do you hang out with them? Again, uh, you know, facts are not something that stick in my head for long. Uh, I think it is, I don't know. If it, uh, anyway, Maria is the one who would be able to tell you probably to the day that, you know, and I can't, but it, I, I doubt very much knowing what my schedule was like at the time working in corporate America, that we were there longer than a week. Okay. Yeah. By the way, it's the same with my wife, Debbie and I, she, she keeps track of the dates and the kind of historical timeline. And for right. me, 15 years ago could have been last week uh, it's all exactly and it's really difficult and that, that actually I struggled with that I was a, pro a project manager at Intel and I have a very very serious uh, defect as far as project management is concerned I cannot keep track of time and space <laughs> you know that's that's a very difficult uh, challenge and you know anyway hey, so, man, yeah. let's, we'll chalk it up to the UG effect yeah um, so you have this, uh, you know, whatever it was, few days a week hanging out with UG. What was your feeling when you left? Did you feel like satisfied? Did you, you know, just what did it feel like when it was time to go home to corporate America? Well, first of all, 
that was a running thing between Eugene and I is I hated corporate America and he really wanted me to be chained to it. I think I told you this when we had a first chat about it. But um, it, to answer the question directly, I, wa uh, I wanted more. Uh, I wanted to be around him, mm. you know? Yeah, because just being there was unburdening. Me being in his presence was unburdening. And I'll give you another idea of just how profound that could be. We were driving around in Switzerland. Often, you know, Maria was one of his drivers. She's a very good driver. She's from Germany, knows how to drive very precisely and very fast. Both things Yuji liked a lot. Right on. Okay. And we're driving and I'm in the back seat. I think, um, of course, Maria's driving. Yuji's in the passenger seat as he always was. And there probably were a couple other people in the car. Wait, so Yuji always rode shotgun? Yep. That's great. Yeah. Okay. And very often, and this is another interesting thing. I have no idea what he was doing, but he had like, I guess they're called Kriyas. You would know better than I do, but we were in traffic and suddenly Yuji's hands start dancing. So you had uh, like mudras. Mm -hmm. Mudras, yeah, spontaneously. And it's like he's directing traffic. I, I don't, I, I can't even say what was happening there, but it was just, a, it's a very unusual thing to be driving in a car while that is happening in the uh, That's interesting. Uh, in, um, in, I think it's in Mystique of Enlightenment, he mentions kind of in an offhand way that after the calamity, his hands uh, started to move. Like, so it's the way it's written, you don't get a clear idea of what what is happening, but it says something like, UG demonstrates a hand moving in this way. And he said, my hands started to move in another way and people called them mudras. And he just said it in kind of offhand way, but this is, I think, what he is talking about, that his hands would move in these weird ways spontaneously. Yeah. Um, yo no so. I have no idea, really. <laughs> it's beyond, is that literally beyond me? I, I don't know, but it, it was different to be with him is one of the things I'm trying to put across. The other thing is, so we arrive at the destination and, you know, we went to places that often required, we had to park the car in a parking garage. So, and, and parking garages in Europe, the space is, is much smaller. You have to navigate much smaller spaces. Maria calls it millimeter work. <laughs> and, you know, so she parked in such a way that the, the people who were in the car could actually exit the car so that she could complete the work, okay? And I was so out of it. Uh, and she was out of it too, but she's driving. Hmm. She hit me with that car while she was doing her millimeter work three different times. And I was too stoned to get out of the way. And she was too stoned to notice that she was hitting me. Hmm. So, it, you know, tra driving with Yuji and traveling with Yuji had uh, its own challenges. I mean, wonderful challenges, but... You know, oh. I still tease Maria to this day about how, how you know, frequently she tried to kill me on that day. Um, yeah, I could picture it. So there's this little narrow slot that she's got to fit the car into. So once she gets in, you're not going to be able to open the door. So, er okay, everybody out. I got to do my millimeter work. And she's doing that. And you're standing by the car and she ends up hitting you. <laughs> three times. She hits me once and I try to move out of the way. She hits me again. <laughs> she hits me three times. That's like uh, the UG version of the the peacock feather, you know, is Maria hitting you with the the Audi? <laughs> it, it, I don't think it was an Audi on that particular day, but yeah, we probably, probably we a actually, sob. yeah, and another, another time, if you don't mind my telling you another travel with UG story. Well, before we do that, let's, yeah. uh, I got to take a pit stop. Oh, yeah, right. Me too. <laughs> okay, great. Be back in a moment. <laughs> Okay, so another uh, UG travel story? Yeah. Um, again, Maria's driving, and it, it, we would get good cars, but, you know, we're, we're not rich people. And uh, UG used to like to travel around in a Lincoln Continental. 
And through some strange quirk of fate, we ended up getting upgraded uh, to an Audi, I mean, a really advanced Audi. So we're driving around in this very expensive car with, uh, with a man who, um, you know, would put out these vibes. And, and as a result, um, Maria ended up driving that car backing up into a cement post in some place in Switzerland, you know, and um, one of the other German friends um, actually was very clever and came up with a solution, which Yuji, you know, completely loved, which was he actually applied cosmetics to the car to, to, to um, make the damage look less severe than it actually was. And there was some imperfection on the car and we, we didn't end up having to pay a penny as a result of the uh, work, the fine work that was done by another German friend. And anyway, that is just, it, it, it had a very profound impact on people. And I remember any movement in any direction is taking you further away from yourself. And another statement what, that he made was that he was doing his best to stop us in our tracks. He said, essentially, People get stuck and they uh, and they create a, a clutched state by following a pleasure movement, never even allowing for a moment of pain to enter in. Everything is designed to help you avoid the harsh realities. And if the movement away with that pleasure movement slows down substantially, only then is it possible for life to take over again. And then it's out of your hands what happens. That is a very important part of um, Yuji's, let's say, point of view mm -hmm. that I think is, uh, that's my takeaway of that's a, that's, that's a core uh, aspect of, of Yuji's, um, what, whatever he had to say, it was, it was about impact and, you know, he's also, famous for saying, I'm just a dog barking. Well, that's the thing about a dog barking. I, I can tell you, uh, having been attacked by a pretty, a barking dog that was intent on biting me, that nothing st stops you in the tracks, like a dog, you know, really going for it, a big dog with uh, strong teeth action going, and you, you mm -hmm. know you're about to be attacked. Yuji had that effect on on people, um, and that you can see, I think, in on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we talked about this before. That's one of my favorite uh, UG isms is you know him saying, "I'm just another dog barking," and I always uh, took that in a way of um, what would be like kind of a self denigrating kind of way, like, "Ah, don't don't listen to me. I'm just a dog barking." But then you you um you brought in that other perspective that also yeah a barking dog will stop you in your tracks and, and arrest thought, right? And then life takes over in that moment, like your instinct takes over. Yes. Yeah. So when you're driving around with UG and you're getting kind of loopy and feeling high, do you think that that is what you were feeling was life arising and and that felt like uh, you're in a kind of alternate stage or something? Well, I think when the energy is strong, it pushes you out. And uh, I have had, uh, had some experiences like probably most anyone, if you're paying attention, there, there are times when you're pushed out, but you're still present. Mm -hmm. some, some things, something is present, yeah. Awareness still present. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that this was, um, first of all, it was very deep rest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you wake up and you're like, boy, man, are you refreshed, you know, and except, you know, if your wife's hitting you with a car, then it's not as good. But other than that, it, it you know, it's always delightful, right? And mm -hmm. uh, after waking up from um, a, 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 a moment when your body really could fully take you back to stasis to a resting spot. Hmm. It was very, 
it was great. And I, I think, you know, those moments have an impact beyond those moments too. I, I think you're establishing uh, in a way it may be a new groove in a certain direction, making it more possible to move back home that way. Yeah. That's what I tell people all the time who have some kind of awakening experience. It's uh, I call it the a little taste of freedom and you don't have to keep going to the well actually, because it gives you a different touchstone to show you that uh, there's another way of being in the world that's possible. Mm -hmm. Right. And just even that, if you don't take it on as another kind of project um, to, to chase after, right. Uh, can be liberating, but that's, that's often the conundrum is that people get that taste of freedom and they go, I want more. It's like an alcoholic getting that first sip of whiskey and it's all over, you know, they're on another bender, like then and we're on like spiritual benders. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this, this craving for uh, bliss is as bad as craving for, for anything else. I mean, in that, sense of where it's taking you you know is it taking you closer to yourself or is it taking you away from yourself craving bliss, for bliss yeah. junkies just popped into my mind bliss junkies good and uh eugene never talked about that although he did say once to me as an aside and i don't know why like so many things he said he said you know david even i sometimes feel bliss that's what he said to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even I. Yeah. Almost like, you know, like another a, a guru would maybe confess to someone close to them, like, you know, even sometimes I get sad and angry. But Yuji's like, you know, even sometimes <laughs> I feel bliss. It's like, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Like his side effects may include momentary feelings of bliss. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, yeah, what a guy. What a guy. Oh, what my guy. God. Um, I think, like, you know, if you write a memoir, maybe you and Maria should write one together and maybe, like, trade off so that we can see the different perspectives at play there. But I imagine the title of the memoir could be something like Riding Shotgun with UG or <laughs> something like that. I, You know, I really resisted uh that in general um i don't know why but it's sort of like you know if you have i mean it it is so intimate i mean nothing is more intimate than being with a, a guy you can see right through you and uh i don't i have never you know written about an intimate affair i've had with anybody man, you know man or woman i i probably will never um, do that but hmm. i appreciate it, it you know i like the title i'd like to brainstorm some titles with you but I like <laughs> maybe that's out. what we could do just like just come up with titles for you know these uh, imaginal memoirs <laughs> but it, um, it's a miracle that such a such a person existed i mean i still to this day it's like did this really happen that i you know because I, I'm pretty sure there's nobody who's ever been around Yuji that came away feeling, well, I really deserve that. I mean, I honestly, I can, I can only chalk this up to just sheer dumb luck that I came into his orbit. And, um, you know, being around someone whose main objective in life was not to falsify himself and doing his darndest to prevent us from doing that to ourselves, what that's just a blessing that there is no explanation for. I think I, mm. I can't imagine being any luckier than that. Um, one of the things that we connected on when we talked earlier is that we both come from like working class backgrounds and like, there's nothing in my family history. And, and I think it sounds like yours as well, that would suggest um, that we would, first of all, um, be seeking anything spiritually or, um, in, you know, find our way to someone like UG and, uh, you know, because some people grow up in like kind of hippie homes and they're, 
you know, their parents were part of some ashram and they kind of pick it up through osmosis and they kind of carry that on in a way. Uh, but for me, that this whole thing is just, it's like out of the blue. And if anything, it's given me a belief in, uh, in karma and reincarnation that there must've been something going on in a past life where I'm just kind of picking up where I left off because there really, I'm such an anomaly. There is no explanation for it. Uh, and it's kind of like, it feels to me like I'd been through the spiritual merry-go-round many times before, and I was just ready to have this meeting with someone like UG and just, ah, like kind of feel at home with UG. Yeah, Re really. Yeah. It's, it, it's, there's absolutely nothing in my background, uh, that suggested you know, I didn't have any, my grandfather didn't think that I was, uh, you know, going to be someone who had an inner world, much less <laughs> be, be a master of it or something, which I'm not. But uh, uh, so, yeah, that yes to that. And, um, and what was the other part that I wanted to respond to as well? So that was one part of it. But you said a number of things. If you could remember one other one that you'd like me to respond to, you're going to have to remind me. Oh, I don't know. I'm declutched again. We we're all, we're both declutched. We could just sit here and drool for a while. That that that's more, you know, in keeping with the natural state, I think. I made a note because I really enjoyed this drool drool bucket city. Yeah, that's Yuji <laughs> had that, certainly uh, had that effect on me and so many other people. Really? Well, that's one that's yeah, one thing I'd never heard before is that people would just kind of like conk out in his presence. I hadn't heard that one. He could put an entire room and we're we're not talking about like a hundred people. We're talking about ten or you know, seven or eight. But you know, from one moment to the next, everybody be awake and fun and having fun. And then you look around and it's like a bomb dropped in the room. <laughs> Rule Bucket City. Rule Bucket City. Yeah, it was one time. I think I mentioned this to you. We, we, so we traveled in, in um, you know, in, in cars and we had a little entourage. And, you know, the person who had uh, Yuji, you know, person one, I think, uh, in the car was that usually would lead. And the good drivers and, the, the, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. We're, all of the drivers were good, but they weren't always good to the rest of the entourage. But the good drivers um, would be mindful of the fact that there were other people, you know, trying to keep up so that they could be where UG was too, right? Um, but sometimes, as is the case with humans everywhere, there were little, you know, competitions, uh, so to speak. And, and, some, and, and sometimes the drivers weren't as careful about that. And one, on one of those occasions, I happened to be in that lead car. Maria was not driving. Someone else was driving. And... Um, it seemed like we were trying to ditch the other cars and we end up going to Costco, which is, you know, one of the places UG like to go to, but we parked the car, I call it on the dark side of Costco where, you know, people, you don't usually see that side of Costco. And, you know, we parked the car there and it, there was just three people in the car, you know, UG, the driver and me. And, um, we, we all, beginning with Yuji, just looked drool bucket city. I mean, completely <laughs> slumped over in the car, you know, you could, could have been dead for all you knew. There's just no movement, mouth, mouths open. And the other car somehow finds us on the dark side, the cars, finds us in the dark, on the dark side of Costco. And they, they come and they see what's going on in the car. <laughs> which we, you know, it looks like there are three corpses in the car. And they're Carbon monoxide on poisoning. The, on the windows, you know, to, to wait, you know, hopefully to raise the dead or, you know, find out, well, actually they're just to, decided to take a nap. And, um, you know, everybody breathed a sigh of relief because, you know, we, we, we did wake up and we're all groggy coming out of the car. Um, but that would give another, you know, taste of, you know, people were not saints, uh, none of us, including and especially Yuji. And, you know, sometimes there were little games that were 
you know, being played amongst us. Uh, and another time, I would like to tell the miracle of Flulin. That yeah, but before we go there, I just want to say, like, this to me uh, is such a good example of how UG was a, you know, people call them the unguru, the anti-guru, that kind of thing. Just, just trying to point out that um, he was the complete opposite of all these people who put themselves forward as a guru. But what I'm really getting from that story uh, is like to be so at ease with oneself and with your company, because if everyone is at ease with themselves, it makes it easier for other people to unburden themselves of any pretense or agenda, that kind of thing, right? So everybody's just able to be at ease with themselves enough that you could just let yourself go like completely unconscious to conk out and have a nap together. Like in contrast to some kind of uh, darshan situation where everybody's doing their best to stay awake and spine upright and uptight and all of that. Uh, I want to be in the cult of the nap, you know, where like the... <laughs> The pinnacle of spiritual awakening is to relax enough that you can all just have a nap together. Like that is that is my cult. I hear you, brother. That is beautiful. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> it was, yeah, that, that that that's the way to go. And oh, I I thought of another story that might be good for people to hear. So keep, keep them coming. I mean, you like these? I I love them. Okay, here's another one. So, Yuji, in for whatever reason, he involved himself in helping me with my career. He helped me um, um, do nothing and um, finally cure myself of these lifelong uh, migraines. I would have. I have told you about that. Yeah, tell that story if you would. I would, but I want to get to this one first. You mm -hmm. remind me, right? Thank you. So yeah. the story, the story is um, he got involved in my diet. I was really struggling with my diet. It, it was made worse by working in corporate America, a place I'd swore I'd never work. And it was just an awful place to, to work. And I ate uh, to uh, avoid and evade the pain. And that was my addiction at the time. And so he decided he was gonna help me with this. First of all, he helped me by putting out in the room the idea that I couldn't help myself um, because it was in my genes. There was no one in my family who, who wasn't obese. So you know, no one should judge David, you know, and I, I appreciated it, I really did, you know, because I was self-conscious about the fact that um, I was way too heavy and not well as a result of it. So he involved himself in, in my life and he put me on the all idli diet. Idli, what's that? Idli is, um, they look like little white discs that are made of you know lentil and uh, certain kind of rice, I think. Um, I pop my apologies to all my Indian friends. Like, oh, like uh, little papadam or rice crackers, that kind of thing? No, it, 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 it's made with grain. They're, they're more like um, lightly fried, um, if you imagine rice patties, only it's a lot finer than that. And they, these I, would, yeah. would typically be eaten with chutney. It's a South, yes. Indian, South Indian cuisine. And he says uh, to, to Maria, you know, you must be made to learn how to cook idli for me and for David. And you absolutely need to know how to make the chutney right. So he, one of the things that he did before Yuji fully became Yuji was to, he was a cooking teacher. He was good at um, helping people uh, learn to cook. And he actually made money that way. I never heard that one. So he took it upon himself to train Maria to make idli correctly. They shouldn't be hard like stones. If they're like hard like stones, I will throw them in your face. And uh, to make the idli 
in the right way. And the first thing was you have to get the right ingredient. So we take a trip to San Diego and you know, we're going to go to uh, a South Indian restaurant there and, and some of our friends who come to visit him in Palm Springs are from San Diego. So it's great. And, and while we're there, he takes Maria by the hand and we go into this shop and he explains to her how she needs to buy the ingredients for the idli and the chutney. And for weeks, she's practicing and finally she's, she's getting it down and, you know, Yuji's happy and I'm eating the idlis and I'm as happy as I can be about eating idlis. And, uh, and then um, she's in the kitchen fussing with the, the chutney and she's not getting it. And Yuji comes in the kitchen and, and um, he says, what are you doing? She, she, she says, I'm, I'm trying to make, you know, make the, the Italy the way you, you taught me, sir. And he says, you don't understand. And I'm going to try to do this so that you can actually see what he did, because I saw the whole thing, too. You don't understand. I don't like chutney at all. And it was so absurd. There were two women in, in the kitchen at the time, it was Maria and our good friend Lisa. It, were both, it was hysterical. You know, here's Yuji raging about how he doesn't care for chutney. It's all he's been doing is eat. He's teaching her how to make the chutney. He's eating the chutney. And then he makes this statement and makes this dramatic sword cutting through the air, kind of a, you know, violent, I don't like chutney at all. And that just to give you an idea of how fluid, you know, and, and absurd the, the whole enterprise was. Huh. So uh, did Maria continue to make at least for you? Like, did you stick with this diet? Of course. <laughs> and what are we talking like at least for every meal? Yeah, at least that's all at least only at least only. Yep. <laughs> How long to this day or did you know? Oh, no, no, because I was getting fatter eating the Idlis. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> 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 yeah i i made some adjustments later on um, here's yeah here's what i was expecting yes i i stuck with the idli diet for three months i i lost i got back to my kind of normal weight and after that i could just eat whatever i wanted no the idli's made you fat <laughs> not at all <laughs> thanks ug <laughs> <laughs> but but it you know it made me pay attention uh to something that i wasn't paying attention to and then I found my own way with it. And, you know, my weight is, you know, relatively, I have a, I have a normal BMI now. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm again, um, healthy and it didn't hurt that I'm away from corporate America. I will say that. Yeah. But maybe there's some like crazy wisdom at work there in that it just helped to kind of get you out of the track that you had been on, um, by introducing something completely foreign and, being like disciplined about it and then your own uh natural intelligence kicked in at that point i found my own way that's yeah really, that's really what when you're around yuji that is the only way to go you have to find your way and it it shouldn't be a way out it, it can't it you know it, that's the one requirement as long as it's uh you're turning you know to face the music you know, you have to find out that in your own way, what, what that is that will allow you to do that. And it's, I think it's very different with each person. And mm -hmm. that's why I believe, and I, I, I emphasize that word, why I believe both the Krishnamurtis were against a way, you know, sort of a, a way for everybody. It's like, no, it's like, there's just, there's Brian's way and there's David's way and there's every Every person had their own way. Mm -hmm. Never taught. Um, he never taught a way. It, he ever. And it was never about changing anything. The way was about taking what comes in stride, not not running away from it. Mm. And, and you've talked a little bit about uh, how he wanted you to stick with the corporate gig, even though you hated it. 
And you had told me before that um, you were involved in like kind of social justice work as a lawyer and, and things like that, right? And then you ended up at uh, this big uh, technology corporation, which was, um, I guess, financially successful. But there was something about UG, like he uh, he didn't discount the practicalities of like Western lifestyle. Like he understood that you need to make money in order to relax and be comfortable and take care of your responsibilities and things like that. Right. So contrary to other gurus who would tell you to like drop out, he would often say, no, no, stick with this. And you told me that he even told Maria, it's like, don't let him like chain him to that desk, so, something like that, right? Correct. He said, chain him to the Intel. That's how he referred to Intel, the Intel. <laughs> chain him to the Intel. Don't let him leave. Do not let him leave. And, um, you know, I worked at Intel until I couldn't go another step. And then I, I had to leave because I could no longer do my job. At some point, I was just so overwhelmed. I mean, they used to have um, a worldwide call with the, um, the top technology leaders in uh, web publications. And I also uh, was involved in training our team that does shop floor control, moving product through the factory lines and so on. And uh, I would talk to people who for whom English was not a first language in China, the Philippines, Japan, uh, Malaysia, uh, and India. And I would, you know, everybody has their own private agendas, no matter, uh, no matter the fact that you're wearing a, a badge with your corporate values and your corporate values are all the change. Strange, but applying these labels to your clothing doesn't have an impact on the inside, really. So everybody has their own agenda. It could be, it could easily devolve into chaos when you're trying to present a training program before it gets rolled out worldwide, which is my job in corporate America. And I no longer could do that. I no longer could handle that. And that was the job. So, you know, when you can't do your job anymore, it's time to give it up. I mean, I was going to get fired and I might as well leave on my own terms. And that's ultimately what happened. But as a result of Yuji's insistence, we live in a nice house now. We have, um, you know, our fi we have, a fi we have uh, financial planners managing our money, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. so, You're kind of um, set up for having uh, more freedom later in life. Correct. And what he said, uh, which is correct, is he said, you know, you're going to be miserable. My, he said, my experience is people are going to be miserable no matter what. <laughs> Better to be miserable with money than without. You'll be more miserable without the money. So do it, you know, and, and he helped people. He was known for helping people with money matters. He was very good at it. He was very skillful. And... Um, and that was his, uh, yeah, when, another time when he was, um, he thought he was dying because of a fall he took in the Black Forest. He wanted to, he wanted to show me, um, anyway, he had kept binders about the various people that he was helping and he wanted me to see that. Hmm. And I, I think I told you, he said to me, seeing a day that will, in my view at this time will never come that if I ever should want to teach anybody anything, he said, you could, you, you never, never charge for that or never charge for this is the word that he used to refer to this interior stuff. He said, you can, you can get um, money if you want by helping people with their careers. And he showed this is, you know, these are the arrangements I made with, um, with, with a variety of people, he bragged that he and I were running an international law firm together, <laughs> and that we had never lost a case. That's so sweet. Like what I hear from people is that he often had these kind of inside jokes with each individual, and um, even like nicknames for people and things. Right? Like yes. he seemed uh, to have the ability to relate to a, a wide swath of, of people from um, 
different social strata, different cultures. You think that, um, did you feel that, that that's the case that he could just relate to anybody? He could. He absolutely could. He was, he was very good at it. And, you know, and he, he, there were times he didn't want to, in a way he was um, keeping it small because there were, I think there are people who are ready to be with Yuji and people who are not. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very harsh message. And until you get to the point where you realize I am the hell, you know, not forget about what Sartre was reported to have said, I, th I think it was supposed to be the other is the hell. Well, with Yuji, you know, you, you're carrying. Oh, hell, hell is other people. Yeah. Hell is other yeah. people. No, hell is you. <laughs> you know that was you know and if you and you don't immediately come to that uh mm -hmm. and and the people who are ready to hear that could stick and the, the other people not so much really so um by keeping it small you're actually preventing these people who are not ready for that message from falsifying where they are at that moment the, the main thing was not to add to the burden of this world by further falsifying people, both the ones that don't belong there and those that do. And by keeping mm -hmm. away the masses, because the masses are not ready to hear, you know, you're complaining about everybody else, but you're the problem here. Right. Your, your hell that you're avoiding is keeping you in hell. Okay. Yeah. And by keeping it small, it was possible for Yuji to work with effectively with a small group of people. Yeah. Uh, and there, I think there's something in there about like, you know, if somebody shows up and they're really insistent on the seeking thing and like asking him spiritual questions, which he always seemed to be bored and frustrated by, um, that that might actually interrupt the the group vibe of just hanging out. You know, it's like somebody comes in and kind of ruins the hangout session by bringing all this like spiritual baggage and everything. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and he made the point we're, so we're in this we have a, a little cottage on this property on Via Escuela where he came in his last years and my brother-in-law Maria and I are the only people who are sitting with Eugene in this little cottage and um, my brother-in-law asked him he said, Yuji, why aren't you talking like you did in the old days I mean talking about the real things you know and Yuji leaned forward in his chair and it's this tiny cottage. So he's practically in his face. And he says, do you mean to tell me that you think you'd be sitting here if I talk like that today? Hmm. So it was for the benefit of the people who were there. I mean, Yuji gave a lot of personal attention to, to, to us all. Um, and the reason why that was so was because these other people who were not going to get anything from anything of value from Yuji, they, except maybe falsifying themselves and pretending they were ready to hear a message they really weren't ready to hear. He, he, he took it into his own hands to um, prevent that from happening. That's how I view it. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, um, a video that I saw once of uh, Byron Katie, the spiritual teacher from uh, Ojai, going to meet with Yuji. And I suspect that she had somebody filming it, you know, this encounter with this burgeoning spiritual teacher with Yuji, you know, the living enlightened man. Uh, and it's so interesting to watch the dynamic going on between them because there's Byron Katie appearing. Um, so there's a term that young people use called uh, thirsty. It's like when you're you're kind of signaling things out into the social media world in order to get some kind of affirmation or likes. And, you know, so she looks incredibly thirsty for UG's approval or recognition of her enlightened state. And you can see her really trying to steer him in that direction. And he just doesn't want anything to do with it. Like he's got like a Teflon coating. <laughs> she keeps trying to 
to coax him into this and getting it on film, I suspect, as a kind of uh, badge of authenticity or something, you know, like UG recognized my enlightened state, but he just will not play along. And it's really funny to see that dynamic, you know, somebody with um, such a kind of like nakedly thirsty with this agenda and then him just doing this kind of uh kind of psychic aikido <laughs> yeah he wouldn't yeah he wouldn't let that happen yeah uh, but you know you, were there a lot of people going to him looking for like ug stamp of approval on my attainment or something or were those people just you know a dog barking up the wrong tree in my time with him, I'm trying to think uh, if I'd ever seen that. I mean, I didn't see Byron Katie come to Yuji, but I helped Yuji get the initial. It, um, he he had a number of interviews that he wanted to put up on the internet, and he asked me to get that done. I think I I'm not sure if that was one of them, but there's an if you go to the Yuji uh, sites where these videos are, are posted, you'll see that there was an original batch that might have be that might be among them. I don't even remember, remember. Mm -hmm. But um, what was your question again? Sorry about that. Well, if there were people kind of coming oh, into the group I, and looking I, for yeah, his approval. I didn't see Byron and... Katie. I didn't see, uh, I know a number of people did come to see him, but that is the only example of the thing um, that we're talking about right now was with, with Byron Katie. I can't remember. I know Jane Campion came to him, but not in my presence. Um, and I think they got along great. I, you know, well, Jane, you know, wasn't, didn't, never made any claims of being enlightened. And by the way, Yuji would absolutely uh, clobber you if you said he was enlightened. He, you know, natural man, okay, but enlightened, not so much. Hogwash. Well, interesting you mentioned Jane Campion. Um, so people who are listening, if you don't know Jane Campion, the great, uh, I think, Australian director, mm, the piano and other things, but she did a, a really amazing kind of noir-ish uh, series called Top of the Lake. Yes. And Holly Hunter plays a spiritual guru um, who's like, her name is like GU or something like that. And as soon as I wash, I go, oh my God, this is That's based right. on UG. And so I did some sleuthing and I found out that um, Jane had uh, met UG or been influenced by him or something. So uh, what did you see that show? Did you see this depiction of the UG type character? I did. I, I, I mean, I, I, my taste is my taste. And I don't want to say anything you know bad about it, but I know I didn't. I didn't stick with it and, and watch it all the way through, but I did look at it because I was aware that she was using Yuji as the model for her character. And Jane Campion, uh, Yuji had praise for her, um, not not because she was, uh, you know, just her skill. You know, Yuji was very um, instrumental in Mahesh Bhatt's directorial career, so he would he had been involved in guiding um, people about how to make, you know, real gritty stuff, the stuff that the masses could put their arms around, you know? Yeah. yeah Cause UG would say like, don't be in conflict with society. Like just be excellent at uh, you know, what you're talented at and how you can actually make money with that talent. Yes. He said, yeah. don't pay attention to the critics, make movies that the common man will pay they're, they're very valuable money to see. Pay attention, UG really was concerned, concerned is probably not the right word, but um, about the common man. You know, for him, it didn't matter what form of government you're talking about, as long as it, if it helped the common man, he was for it. That was mm -hmm. the acid test. He didn't, he didn't, you know, catering to the rich was not, uh, not Yuji's thing. Not hmm. that he was against the money, just he, he wanted, you know, if, he, if if government wasn't looking out for the common man, they weren't doing, it wasn't doing its job. That to him was the job of government. Mm -hmm. Not, not uh, about, I mean, he didn't, 
embrace the free market like libertarians uh, do. Mm. The so-called free market. Invisible. Well, he had no ha he had no hang up about money. No, I think that yeah, and he had no hang up about you making money. He didn't see that as a form of being, um, you know, caught up in materialism or anything else. Uh, he, there was no uh, kind of like pretense of purity or um, yeah, and yeah. He, he wasn't into any ism. It wasn't like I ideology. You need you need food to eat. You need you know you need food to live. Uh, you need money to, to, to eat. You need money to live. So make money. You need, yeah. you, know, you need that in this world. We're no longer bartering chickens. Yeah. And I think one of the things maybe that doesn't come across in some of those uh, Rage and Sage videos is actually his appreciation for culture. Like I've heard stories about him asking um, his Indian musician friends to sing uh, Hindu bhajans, and uh, he he enjoyed like palm reading as a form of entertainment and and astrology and things like that. Yeah. So he wasn't like rejecting everything, but he was just saying, well, uh, um, have it uh, take it with a certain kind of attitude. Like don't take it all so seriously. Don't take it literally, but enjoy it. Yep. Is that he, right? He was. He he um, was highly entertained by uh, astrology readings and palm readings and naughty readings. It, he said, "For me, it's just an entertainment." So he he liked it, but he wasn't um, you know making you know making it possible for people to have a big head about the the great gift of their readings mm -hmm. is in a way its own gift. I say, tell you, you know, he would do things to prevent people from using anything that he said uh, from strengthening and fortifying um, their ego. So I, I think I told you this little story about one time when we were in Italy near Lago Maggiore. We were staying in a, a really nice um, small hotel. And um, he, he, he was wanting to pump me up for whatever reason. So he, he, want, he went to talk to the owner of the hotel about something, I don't remember what it was. And he took me with, and you know, he says to the owner of this hotel, hey, I wanna introduce you to David Solomon. He's a really big man at Intel, a really big man at Intel. And I'm embarrassed because actually I wasn't a big man at Intel, but he's doing it. And, and then, and that, by the way, he would often say things that weren't true about you as compliments. So you really, you know, you really couldn't take that as, uh, you know, puffing you up. But it, it did was an excuse to receive some energy from him. Mm -hmm. so he finishes telling this guy what a big man on the campus I am at Intel. And before he fully exits the room with this guy, you know, we turn back to leave and go back to our room there in the hotel. He turns to me and says, what is it you do at Intel again? <laughs> I think and it's like his way of help, it, helping it, out his friends, right? He made fictitious, he created fictitious stories for virtually everybody. You yeah, know, he, this he, this he, helps he, me understand something. So my uh, my old yoga teacher, he would do the same thing. And uh, when we would go travel somewhere, he'd say, oh, Brian's the best yoga teacher in the world. <laughs> and then he had me teach a class. <laughs> that's good yeah it's it's fun um yeah it's fun and again i i used to say my description of how, why he would do this is he would child proof the room you know you're gonna do your darndest to continue to build you as you know yourself up but he was going to deny you of every last bit of food that would help you do that so he wouldn't let you hurt yourself in that way by further burdening yourself. So he gave you energy, but he did it in such a way that you couldn't come away and go, you know, you know, he, he said about me that, you know, I saved Rajneesh, you know, my, cause I was a lawyer there. I was amongst uh -huh. a small band of lawyers but working with Niren, who was in that uh, documentary that you mentioned. And he said, you know, he would say about me, he saved he saved Rajneesh. He told him, 
you know, he made up some story that was absolutely, there's not, there wasn't one shred of truth about it. But whenever he'd introduce me to people, he was a lawyer for right. He did all of this. And it's like, and I'm just like inside. No, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I mean, okay. This is bringing up probably another reason why I just uh, feel this affinity for UG is because he was such a trickster. And um I, I have a lot of trickster in me too. I, you know, I love to tell fibs and to gossip and things like that. Um, that, okay. So that's kind of like, uh, this gets to something I, I think about often is like, what do I think is a sign of like real enlightenment of like real uh, self-knowledge, like knowing who you really are. And that to me involves not taking yourself so seriously, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, a sign of attainment of some kind of like uh, spiritual awakening is a uh, a sense of humor and playfulness, you know? And I, I think I can always tell when someone has a relaxed relationship with their ego when they can just laugh freely, tell jokes, gossip, not um, pretend that they're kind of above all that or something. You know, so when I see somebody out there on the public stage who's putting themselves up as a spiritual authority and teacher guru, very often they're the dullest, flattest people I've ever seen. <laughs> I think to myself, like, why, why would anyone want to pay money to go hang out with this person? <laughs> like, how boring. It's, I guess it's really scary, you know, to take full responsibility for yourself. And it's easier dating back to the days of mommy and daddy to suppose that other people have the answers and they will protect me. Mm -hmm. I think it's a security it's like an outsourcing of authority. And if it's not mommy or daddy, because, you know, somewhere along the line, you reject them, you rebel against them. But there's still that there's a vacancy then. And these gurus are like, just perfect to slot into that that vacancy, right? And take that position. And they feed off of it and you you get something from it. And it turns into this really kind of gross capitalistic codependency. A good description. I think it is. Uh... And that, you know, when Yuji would bash um, the gurus, he was pointing to, to that. Mm -hmm. This thing that you could, um, you could promote enlightenment in the masses, you know, with a way and charge a lot of money for that. Um, you know, when he criticized JK, it was because he was doing things similar to that at least things he said he was doing you know uh you know like creating these schools protecting the teaching and its pristine purity and you know mm -hmm. it's taking yourself kind of seriously and you're 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 non-existing teaching quite seriously if you're creating schools to teach it yeah that's the great contradiction with jk right is uh, you know one one side of his mouth he's preaching this no path thing on the other side uh he's allowing all these books to be written and the teachings to be codified into uh, curriculums and he's giving you a path and he's saying you know you have to uh do this self-reflection and awaken the intelligence and all this and uh you know quiet quieting the mind and so yeah like Yuji hated hypocrisy and he talks about an early experience where um, he, I think he was following Shivananda or one of those Indian gurus and uh, who was saying to people, you know, don't eat uh, hot food, don't eat spicy food, don't eat chilies and these kind of things, you know, the kind of the ascetic path. And then he caught him sneaking some uh, uh, ma mango pickles or something. Right? And he was like, ah, yeah, like and, a and spicy pickle. Said. He said the, the acid test is whether what it is they're saying operates in their lives. How does it operate in their lives? Yeah, that was a big thing for him, right? Like, show me the money. <laughs> well, that was another, yeah, that would, you know, he was openly saying, you know, money was important and he understood that uh, early on. He wanted cash on the barrel. Those are the, that's the language he. But that, but that's like the, the, the figure, the, in the figurative sense, like show me the money, like 
walk the walk. You know, if your oh, teachings okay. are really true, that's, that's what you're, if you're, if what you're selling really works, uh, then show me the money, like show me that, how does it operate in your life? And I, I've heard him even kind of turn that back on people who were interviewing him, who were like devotees, you know, they wanted to be the devotees. And you say like, look, all of this stuff, it doesn't matter. Like how is, how has this affected your life? You being with me, how has it really affected your life? How is it operating in your life? The, the proof is in the eating of the pudding. Right. So final question. Yes. David Solomon, how is UG's influence operating in your life? I mean, how has it changed you? Has it changed you? It's easier to ask how hasn't it? I mean, <laughs> there are it, it, it um, not running after things is is uh, a blessing in itself. Mm. Understanding. Um, that it really matters who's driving your bus. There's a certain kind of uh, discernment that comes from hanging out with uh, a man like uh, Yuji. And um, he lived uh, very simply. He didn't take more than was needed. You know, it's like the Native Americans in that respect. He showed the utmost respect even reverence for, for nature, his own and the life all around in all of these ways. Um, and in my relationship with my, with my wife, he was involved in that too. Uh, one of the most important things that anyone has ever said to me, you know, I've been married to Maria since uh, 1986. You can do the math, I'm bad at that. <laughs> and uh, Maria could tell you to the month, um, but he, at one point we had, this was before we had moved to Palm Springs and actually started, you know, uh, renting the, the, the property where he would come. Uh, we had a knockdown fight. We didn't, and it was one of those fights where neither one of us was even aware of what it was we were fighting about. That's the worst kind. Yeah, the fights where there's no winners, you know? <laughs> There's no winners and we don't even know what we're arguing for, you know, and it was like that. And we're physically distant from where Yuji is staying. So he did, it's not like we were all together in some structure where the walls were so thin, he could hear all this stuff. So this is this, we had this terrible, terrible fight. And we're the first people who show up in the room, wherever that was that time. And uh, Maria was walking in first and he says to her, it's just not possible for two people always to have harmonious relations. That's the, out of the blue, he just says that to her. Hmm. And that, that ripples uh, in our, that still resonates in this household today. It's, it's really set the expectations. It's like, mm -hmm. if you think just because you, you like someone, even that you love someone or are in love with someone, that that means you're always going to have harmonious relations it's 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 just not possible and yeah. and then i i think you know again this is a kind of romantic idealism that people really suffer from and we we were really suffering from that and suffering a lot less as a result of yuji's very pragmatic realistic take on humanity and our shortcomings as such you know where we fall short and in, in in the nature of things it can't yeah. be otherwise unburdening of the expectation of perfection i mean that's good yeah ah oh, this has been so good to finally you know gossip about ug you know you we could do this for a long long time and i'm glad i had the opportunity to do it with you oh great um you know maybe we could put together a book just through these like conversations you know Riding shotgun with UG. <laughs> you keep uh, come back with the proposal. You know, I don't know. There, <laughs> it's a it's a big world. It's a really big world, and there are a lot of different uh, facets to this diamond. Yeah, I even think like um, 
UG as marriage and career counselor in Ohio. <laughs> like that could be a book, like life lessons from UG or, you know, like really practical stuff like uh chicken soup for the soul, but uh, um, idlis for the soul. <laughs> hey, would you Ch like Ch chutney for the soul? Maybe. Would you like to hear just how, uh, in, I mean, blunt UG could be in a, in a way that is, um, well, delightful, but unless you're on the receiving end. One last, yes. one last story. Give it so, to you me. Know, it's very common today, and that's why I'm, I'm thinking of it, for people to get into this non-dual lingo and be completely in their head and think that they have, oh. the, because they have the right intellectual <laughs> things to say. Don't get, don't get me started with the non-dualists. Right? <laughs> So, so this is a story that Yuji told. Unfortunately, I, I didn't witness it, but he told the story often enough that it's almost as if I was in the room when he did. And every time he told the story in a way he brought up, you know, the energy of the whole thing. So there's, there's this great teacher, I don't remember who his name is. And, you know, he was coming to Yuji to show off just how much he knew about how time and space don't exist. And he came with his assistant, it was a woman. And so they're sitting there with Yuji. This is Yuji telling the story, of course. And um, he starts going on about, on and on about how time and space don't really exist. And Yuji looks at the, at, the, at the couple, and then he looks at the guy and he says, do you mean to tell me that you could fuck this bitch if there was no time and space? You know, and everybody was like, you know, yeah, you, you can't even park a car, much much less have fun with a woman if, if, if there's no time and space. So why are you having this secret affair and trying to keep it silent if, uh, you know, anyway, again, not operating in, in the light? Well, I mean, that is, you know, um, an aspect of the archetype of the trickster is if, if the trickster is in the presence of somebody who's inflated, trickster is just going to take him out at the knees you know and so i think ug would turn that on in different ways right like he saw something that this guy was a phony that there's probably something going on between them and he just like poof, came in there and, and dropped that bomb that's right and by the way it was a very potent um reminder not to not to engage in stuff like that in front of him anyway, you know, so at least you were going to be on your best behavior. If you're going to hang out with Yuji, you wouldn't do such a thing. None of that spiritual non-dual mumbo jumbo. None of that. <laughs> None of that. You know, we're talking about, you know, funds availing, God willing, and, you know, oh, oh God, if there is a God, save my soul, if there is a soul, and then too, if you can, bastard. That's Yuji's that last bit was huge and then too if you can bastard yeah. well yeah there's a, he loved uh a kind of um western slang and curse words right and um one of the stories he tells is that when he was um kind of struggling early on in life and a layabout in uh, london is he carried around this book of like english slang and he would just read that and pick up these so i think he really delighted in 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 uh, in colloquial slang language, like the language of the streets, and then being able to kind of um, put that out at, at just the right moment, you know, here's this guy who's like, people are putting him up as like this uh, great philosopher or spiritual guru, and he comes out and says some really coarse and crass thing. And again, another way to like, just kind of dismantle yeah. the projection in a way. Yeah, there's a total reset after you you hear him say one of those, you know. <laughs> and is it, you know, he his wisdom was profound. He'd say, you know, that every creature basically focuses for survival purposes on the discordant note. You know, you 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 look around, you say, what doesn't belong in this picture? A cat does that, and he had, he had us up at some big hotel up up um, in the mountains someplace. And actually, I have a photo from that time. I'll show it to you after we finish recording. I don't want to share that with everybody. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he said, you, the, your, your eye, if you, know, if you aren't 
operating around that fixed point, your eye will naturally go to the thing that doesn't belong, the discordant note. And he says, you know, when I look at that vista and we're looking and it's just this beautiful greenery of Switzerland and there's all these trees and there's this tiny little white house in the middle of that thing. He goes, that's where your eye will go. Hmm. And I think he used that, what he understood about that as his um, part of his method of communicating what he had to communicate with us. He would give, he, you know, set the stage and then suddenly introduce this discordant note discordant which you, note which you would remember forever mm -hmm. yeah yeah it would do that job of stopping you in your tracks that too yeah the discordant note i like that that's another that'd be another na good name for the book he was the discordant note I think. what if we uh just <laughs> put out a book of imaginary book titles about yeah. EG. <laughs> yeah, a book to follow. But, you know, for now, we can delight in, in the book and we could even write a blurb for them, you know? Yeah, it's like there's actually no real content to the book. It's just brainstorming all these potential titles of the book and uh, imagining uh, blurbs from UG. <laughs> like, he would, I mean, you know, he gave yeah. us permission. He said, like, do whatever you want with my words and, you know, my so-called teachings. There is no copyright. Just, you know, do whatever you want. Even claim ownership. You can just dis distort, garble, and even claim ownership of all of my words. Who he, he said on more than one occasion, in fact, it is written into his will, you know, who I am and what I am and what I have is prop is, uh, belongs to everyone. That's what that's what he said. God bless you, G. Yeah. Don't, don't say that. He will come back. <laughs> <and smite you. laughs> yeah, I'm just throwing in a discordant note of my own. Good, good job. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you, uh, Brian. It sure was great having fun with you like this. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. And um, I'm sure we'll talk again, uh, you know, off air. Um, I look I look forward to it. All right. Take care. You too.